I'm here. I survived. Um, so, I think the moral of yesterday's story is don't plan anything special because uh, YouTube and Facebook will figure out ways to um, stop it. Um, so, uh, if you didn't, if you weren't with me yesterday, uh, we showed our 1900th film. So I showed a film called Paris 1900 because, you know, the numbers match. And uh, there's some French TV show that, uh, TV company that's claiming it, uh, even though the content of it is um, in public domain because it's all prior to 1920. Um, but that didn't stop YouTube from smashing it, uh, and deleting it, and Facebook, uh, I'm not sure what the status of Facebook is, but, uh, Twitch seemed to hold up really well, and, uh, yeah, if you're on Twitch, thanks. <laughs> but it was, it was kind of demoralizing, plus, because earlier in the day, PayPal decided that they were concerned about three letters that I used in uh, my payment note, MTT, which I'm not sure exactly what that stands for, but it was verboten. And uh, then uh, this morning, I get a call from a car dealership that the, well, car repair place, um, that Prius that we were getting, we dropped off last night to get inspected, had its catalytic converter stolen. So, good time. <laughs> It's technology. We love it. <laughs> so, this is a highlight of my day. Now, the, uh, the thing is, today I'm actually doing three different shows. So I'm doing this show for you guys. Then at 3 o'clock, I'm coming back and we're going to have uh, do something with NC State's Hunt Library. We're going to have an expert. I'm going to watch films about labor and unions. Uh, we had him on last semester. He was really great, David. Uh, and then at 6 o'clock, I'm going to show a um, horror movie, The Horrors of Spider Island. So, doing three shows today. So hopefully YouTube won't, like, bring the hammer down. Facebook won't bring the hammer down, but who knows, man. Wild Frontier, who knows what's going to happen today. Um, but I appreciate you guys tuning in. I appreciate your support. Some of you bought me coffee, which really helped. Um, so thank you. I mean, I'll keep showing these films until um, I can't anymore. Uh, and I've been showing them before Facebook and YouTube existed, and I will show them well after they are gone. Um, and I can't wait for them to go away. I want something else to come and replace both of those entities. Um, and I'm exploring other ways to show stuff YouTube and Facebook both tend to allow me to share things in different groups. Um, YouTube, people stumble across stuff, which is why I'm still on those platforms, but I am actively looking for something else um, when those go away. Um, let's learn about Norwegian children in the 50s. Enjoy. Find our young folks watching herds high in the mountain and girl, but here they come with the herd. He puts the cheese into a mold. Here it will be aged and ready to eat. And here they are, driving in the cattle and the goats. Inger and Halvard are old hands at this. Like others on the fjord, they, with Mother Lundy, bring the herd to the center every summer. Here they tend the herd alone all summer long, while the men of the family stay below on the farm to care for the crops. Now Halvard feeds the cattle their salt for the day. There's some for the goats, too. But this one likes the grass on the roof better. Now they're busy with the milking. Everybody helps, for our farm families here on the fjord make much of their living from milk and butter and cheese. It's too cool and damp here in Norway to grow many crops. 
the waterfall over there across the valley. It's the next morning now, and Halbert is at work early. Today they're going home to the farm on the fjord. Halbert's first task of the day is to send the milk on its way to the dairy. The dairy is far down the mountainside in the village. They send the milk down the mountain on a cable slide. Halbert is putting the milk can on the cable now. A dairyman will pick it up at the bottom of the slide. And here he comes up the path from the village. Now Halbert lets the milk can go, sliding, sliding down the cable. He can't let it slide too fast. There it goes, way, way down the mountain, into the valley far below. And here it comes, ready for the dairyman. He's one of the neighbors whose cattle Inger and Halbert are watching on the mountain. Every day, he and his little daughters come for the milk from the satyr and carry it down to the dairy. There it will be made into butter and cheese. But who is this coming up the mountain? Why, it's Father Lunday with a pony. He's come to take them home. And Inger and Halvard are so glad to be going home, they run out quickly to round up the cattle and goats. The others put mother's cheeses and things into the club on the pony's back. And now, down they go, leaving the satyr till next summer. It's quite a trip down the mountainside to the little farm waiting here beside the fjord. Down there is Brother Olaf. He's mowing hay and looking out for the others to come home. He gathers the hay and hangs it up to dry, for it's too damp in our country to let it dry on the ground. Well, he must see someone coming. Yes, there they are. They're home at last the whole family together again. To Inger and Halvard and their mother, the old familiar fields and buildings look very fine after the long summer living at the center. They hurry straight to the house while the others take the cattle to the stable. Yes, they all think it's good to be home again. Next morning, there's much for everyone to do. Inger polishes up in the kitchen, while Mother is making flatbread. This is our Norwegian bread. Outside on the fjord, Father and Olaf are going out to see what they've caught in the fishing nets they set out last night. Perhaps they'll have a few sea trout at least. Halbert is getting ready to go to the village. He and Inger are going to take some eggs into the dairy. They see Father and Olaf hauling in the net as they go down to the water to take the other boat. The village is a short distance away across the fjord. Inger and Halbert are very much at home in a boat, you know. We who live on the fjords travel on the water almost everywhere. They can't wait to see what Father and Olaf have found in the net. They know they'd better hurry on to the village. Well, over there's a big ship coming down the fjord. This trip to the village is a real treat. It's a pleasant day to be on the water, and they haven't been to the village since school closed in the spring.
Well, here they are at last, close to the village dock. Sometimes there are fishing boats moored here and ships that have come in from far away ports. But today, the dock is quiet. There's nothing to keep Inger and Halvard from hurrying on up to the village street where the shops are. After a summer away, the things in the shop windows seem very inviting. Just look at this beautiful chinaware. This must have come from Denmark or Sweden. You can find interesting things from all over the world here in the village shops. But our friends must go on to the dairy. And there it is ahead. This is where the farmers bring their milk, you know. We call it a cooperative dairy, for all the farmers round about own it together. The dairyman, Mr. Jacobson, is an old friend. He says the eggs will bring a good price when he sends them away to market in the city. Now they have time to see what's going on in the dairy. They watch the people making milk into butter and cheese. Butter and cheese that is sent to other parts This evening, we're going to a little neighborhood festival to celebrate the homecoming from the Satyrs. Our friends are here early, and here come the others. Mother and the other women are wearing our national Norwegian costume, as they often do on special occasions like this. And look, Olaf has brought a pretty neighbor girl. The dancing begins and the older people lead off with a lively step as the fiddler plays an old familiar tune on his hodding fiddle. dance goes on in the long, bright evening with everybody happy to see their friends and neighbors again after a busy summer on the far on the fjord. Good times. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. They, can't, they, uh, they really look at rural Norway and don't spend as much time um, looking at the cities, which are probably more closer to Western. Um, so behind me is Telecine, which I have queued up. And uh, this machine basically what it does is it uh, takes film. There's a camera here. And then there's a little uh, sprocketed wheel here that measures where the frames are. So every time it hits a sprocket, it flashes and sends an image to a frame store or still store. And then that outputs a video signal, which is flicker free. The camera is actually aimed at the film frame. And so what you end up with is a pretty amazing, uh, crisp, flicker free image. Um, and so we, um, this is standard definition, so it gets upsampled to, uh, to HD, but, um, yeah, we, it's a workhorse. It came from Germany. We bought it new. We've had former East Germans in the archive working on it, um, because of some issues during shipping, but, um, yeah, it's pretty great. We love it. So anyways, uh, the reason why I have it and why I do it is because we can show films that I haven't digitized yet. I, I show a lot of films that I've already digitized, I have files of, um, but it's nice to be able to go to the back and show you a, a film that I haven't digitized. And this one is from, uh, 
think it's BYU. And I have not, I've never digitized it. I've seen it. I showed it, but um, yeah. So here's the phone call. Enjoy. Hello, Pam. This is Scott. How would you like to go to the movies with me Saturday night? Your money is safe at State Savings. Time, 541. Temperature, 82 degrees. Thank you. Do you lack confidence? Does the sun set in the west? Hey, Becky, I'm going to the bank. Show this new kid their hopes before we get too busy, okay? Okay, now you try it. Nothing to it. make a great chocolate malt. <laughs> but I think you used a little too much chocolate. Yeah, I'm trying. You certainly are. Hot dog. Hot dog. Separate checks, please. I'm practicing on my bassoon. What? Well, it's bassoon. It's like a balloon with S's. Um, it's an instrument. <laughs> you think Mr. Schremer will fire me? Mr. Beamer. He only yells like that when he's mad. I guess no one ever tried making french fried hot dog buns before. Yeah, well, I know I can pick all this up. The first few days are always tough. 
Why did you take this job anyway? I need money. Paper route wasn't enough. For what? I'm going to take a karate course. Got to build up my confidence. Got to <coughs> call up this girl. Hey, maybe I was a little hard on you. I'd hate to see you lose your job. Think it's easier. Hey, come on, move it. Got to go. Have fun playing your balloon. Yeah, it, it's a bassoon. Come on, move it. I haven't got all day. Let's go. I'm in a hurry. Tell Becky Joe's here. Becky Joe's here. Just a minute. Just a minute. I can hear. You must be the nerd that plays the balloons. Bassoon. Takes all kinds. <laughs> you one without spilling one drop on the floor. Thanks, I'm not in the mood. If I had my bazoon here, I'd play you something happy. Hey, don't worry about me. That's nothing new. Joe's a little hard to understand. Guess I've seen too many movies. Hmm. Yeah, I thought uh, romance was supposed to be romantic. Busy day. Yeah, sure was. Becky? Hmm? Can I walk you home? Long walk. I have long feet. Okay, come on. You're not very talkative today. God, what's the matter? Becky, what's wrong with me? Nothing. Come on, be honest. I can take it. Nothing's wrong with you. Except maybe burning grilled cheese sandwiches all the time. Isn't that only weigh 26,000 grams? Grams? They sound bigger in the metric system. It's the bassoon. No. Now the bassoon, it really hasn't made it with big rock roots yet. But I plan on forming a rock group. I'm going to have an electronic bassoon. I haven't figured out the details yet. Why can't I get a date? Actually, no. But I phoned Pam once. What'd she say? Oh, hello. That's all. I'd rather not go into it. Hey, maybe you just need a little practice. Practice? Listen, why don't you call me tonight? Just for practice. Okay. I'll call you tonight. This is Scott. Hello, Scott. Hello, Becky. Scott, are you still there? Yeah, yeah. Well, why don't you ask me something? Becky. What does a what does a girl look for in a guy? Well, that's hard to say, Scott. It depends on the girl. Well, what do you like? Do you like somebody who treats you rotten like Joe? You don't like him very much, do you? What do I know? He's the success, not me. I sat out in front of the TV, and I had something cold to drink, and uh, I turned on the game. Okay, you say something to me. How's the game? Don't bother me when I'm watching the game. Can't you let me have five minutes in peace? Kind of sounded just like Joe, huh? I don't like it. Well, that's what Joe does to you. Is it? Yeah. You would never do a dumb thing like marry him, would you? I mean, I'm serious about him. I don't know. I bet she treats you the same way after you were married. I never treat you that way, though. How would you treat me? I treat you special. 
Scott, look, I think we better hang up now. Didn't say nothing wrong, did I? No, goodbye. You're mad at me, aren't you? No, I'm just thinking. Yeah, I'm sorry if I said anything to hurt your feelings last night about you and Joe. Hey, maybe I needed to hear it. Yeah, I think you're great, Becky. Yeah, well, I think you're nice, too. Hmm. I wish I were. I feel like your friendly neighborhood's zero. Well, you're not. You've just told yourself that so many times, you're starting to believe it. If I met it in football, then I'd be somebody. Then Pam would go out with me. You're somebody now. I think you're the most decent guy I've ever met. You think so? No. Not me. If I was just better at talking to people, like my dad, he talks to everybody. He just walks right up and starts talking to them. Even gas station attendants. And by the time the gas tank's filled, they're old friends. You can learn. Talk to the customers. Why not? Here you go. Thanks. How are things in California? Are the oranges doing well? What? The oranges in California. How are they doing? Okay. Well, I, I guess if we haven't heard anything, I guess we can assume they're doing okay, and we'll have a good crop of oranges next year. Yeah, wouldn't you say? Um, I see you're driving a Volkswagen. Do you get good gas mileage? Gas mileage? <laughs> I don't know, really. You don't know? You know, I think that's funny. You know, you buy a small car so you can get good gas mileage, and you don't know what gas mileage you're getting. I think that's funny. Don't you think that's funny? <laughs> you forgot your change. You forgot their change. See what I mean? I never say the right thing. That's why I'm afraid to call Pam. Hey, um, maybe after work, if you want, I'll help you own it. Really? If you promise me one thing, don't talk to any more customers. It's a deal. <clears throat> What's wrong? My voice. Scott, don't worry about Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, I need some practice. Oh. Wait, hello? 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 Ah, Pam, this is Scott. Your paper boy. Oh, really? Oh, tell your father I've really been trying not to throw it up on the roof anymore. Oh, no trouble. No trouble. Goodbye. Maybe I'll call her a couple times to break the ice. gotten used to it. <sighs> Becky, um, huh? you know I play the bassoon. Yeah. And that doesn't matter to you, we're still friends? Sure. Well, I'm in an orchestra. We play classical music. Well, that's nice. Someone's got to play it. Really? Well, next, uh, next Thursday night, the Orchestra Society's having a dinner and a dance at the hotel ballroom. And I was wondering, there'll, there'll be a lot of really old guys there, but there'll be a lot of really young guys, too, your age. The brass section. Will you, uh, will you go with me? It's a free dinner. Oh, well, Scott, I'd like to, but... That's great! You know, we've served food all this time together, and we've really never sat down and ate together. What about Joe? I'm not afraid of Joe. Well, it is his night to bowl. <sighs> so what are you going to say? 
Don't worry, I've got it all figured out. A little light conversation to put her at ease. And then, uh, I'll casually ask if she wants to go to the movies with me. This is Pamela Robertson of 1054 Riverside Drive. This is Scott McCorvick of a 619 Riverside Drive. A little light conversation, remember? Say something. I saw, I saw you spraying your dandelions a few days ago. What kind of weed killer do you use? Oh, no, no, that's okay. You don't have to go all the way to your garage to find out. I'll ask your father. Yeah, I bet you did a great job, though. Yeah, I bet you killed off every dandelion in your yard. That's one thing I really like about you, Pam. You're really very thorough. Thank you. I try to be thorough, too. Pam, when I get out of high school, um, I'm going to go to college. Yeah. You know, I don't want you to think I, I was going to get married right away. Oh, why did you say that? Look, I'm putting her at ease. What? Oh, does it sound like I'm talking to somebody? Well, you know, that sure is funny. Well, you know, keep it up with your lawn. Yeah, goodbye. What? You didn't ask her. Didn't come up. Becky? Watch this. You haven't forgotten about the dinner dance tonight, have you? No. You won't have to bring any money. I'm going to pay for everything. I've already called in our reservations. They're saving two chickens for us. I'm worried Joe's going to find out. Becky, I'm not afraid of Joe. Besides, uh, you said he bowls on Thursday nights. Hey, how's it going? It's not. Oh, fire sprinklers went off in the bowling alley last night. They closed it down a couple of days. Whoa! Wow! It's too bad. playing the symphony and once a year we have a dinner dance and I thought it'd be nice for Becky and me. She's not going. Joe, you don't own me. That's true. You either come out here or I'm coming in after you. warn you. Although I may appear to be harmless, I've been trained in the ancient martial arts of the Orient. You have a choice. Either break your date with Becky or I'm going to break your arm. If you do that, there'll be a lawsuit, assault and battery. Break the date. Why? So you can yell at her and make her feel like two cents? She's worth more than that. I'm not going to break your arm. I'm going to break your head. Okay, wait. I'm going to break this board with my hand. Don't 
Press your luck, Joe. Scared him? <laughs> hey, Scott. Why don't you come on in the dance with us? We haven't got dates either. You guys go ahead. I'm waiting for someone. You? Who? Female bassoon. <laughs> <laughs> Noah. about this mail order confidence stuff and just do it. Tell yourself you can do it and do it. I can do it. I can't do it. Oh, would you go make the phone call? Hello, Pam. This is Scott. Did you find out what weed killer you're using? Oh, yeah, I'm sure it's really good. Pam, there's something I want to ask you. You know, uh, I had braces once, too. I mean, that's something we both shared, isn't it? Oh, no. No, Becky's just a friend. Why? Oh, really? He is, huh? Well, you tell him Becky's a fine person. No, Becky broke up with Joe. After I uh, fought him. It's a long story. Some guy wants to take you out next week. Was he at the party last night? Yeah. Now, remember the salad bar? Mm. Remember the guy who offered to help when I spilled the clam chowder on your shoe? Oh, him. Hey, Becky, don't tell yourself it couldn't happen. Pam, let me tell you a little something about Becky. Hope she won't mind me saying. But you know, we both work in the drive-in. Well, when it comes to cleaning the grease trays in the grill, she doesn't do it once a month. She does it once a week, you know what I mean? And she's special. Listen, uh, you tell Mike to come down here tomorrow and I'll put in a good word to Becky about him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Pam, uh, why don't you come down with Mike and I'll buy you a banana split at absolutely no cost to you. But only for you, okay, not Mike. <laughs> yeah, okay. 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 See you later. <laughs> Poor girl. What do you mean? Man, she's really falling for me. How can you tell? Maybe I shouldn't say anything, but uh, on my way to work this morning, she was outside spraying for crabgrass. <laughs> I don't know what we're supposed to learn from that. <laughs> I uh, certainly the awkwardness of talking to a girl on the phone is something that um, I experienced in my uh, teen years. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not clear on what that's supposed to be. Um, I did show this film live once and somebody in the audience actually uh, went to school to BYU, at BYU and recognized the drive-in. He said it was still there, but he had never eaten there because the food was not very good, he said. So there you go. 
Um, thank you, uh, Bill and Mitch, for some uh, delicious coffee. That helps very much. And you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash avgeeks. Um, I think it's time we hear some William Shatner. It's been a long time. Bill. study of the universe spans almost inconceivable extremes of size and distance and time. From the vast island of stars we call a galaxy, to the tiny atom and the particles that comprise it. From cosmic events that occurred billions of years in the past, microcosmic events in the present that endure for only billions of a second. To explore the universe at these extremes, the scientist builds instruments that extend his reach and his vision. His great telescopic eye has the light gathering power of a million human eyes. It peers not only into the depths of space, but far back in time. Since the light it now observes may have left its source when dinosaurs inhabited the Earth. His telescopic ear is tuned to the invisible radio sky. It detects not objects, but the radio regions associated with them and at distances far beyond the range of the largest optical telescope. But the radio waves and the visible light that pass through the Earth's atmosphere to these ground-based telescopes are only part of a broad spectrum of radiation, most of which is blocked by the atmosphere. So electronic instruments are lifted above this murky and turbulent layer. Airborne by rockets, by balloons, in unmanned astronomical observatories, in manned laboratories, and in spacecraft orbiting the planets. Instruments probe the near and distant environments of space and open new windows on the universe. concentration of elementary particles. In one gigantic detonation, the contents of this cosmic fireball were hurled outward in all directions. After a million years of expansion, the universe was an intense blaze of light. Then the radiation cooled. And after hundreds of millions of years, great clouds of hydrogen gas began contracting. And it... evolved into the galaxies we now observe. Inside these galactic whirlpools, smaller fields of gravity condense hydrogen into stars. Stars are inconceivably hot. So hot, they sustain thermonuclear reactions that transform hydrogen into heavier elements.
Sometimes their hydrogen fuel burns so fast, they flare out in violent explosions, hurling new elements across space. Like a great wind, the radiant energy of starlight drives these clouds of dust and gas throughout the galaxy. Out of these clouds evolve new generations of stars. More than half the stars in our galaxy travel in groups of two or more, orbiting around a common center of gravity. Like galactic comets, immense clusters of stars swing in and out of the galaxy in vast eccentric paths. Some small stars do not travel in the company of other stars. Our own sun is one of these. To the astronomer, the sun is a vast laboratory for the detailed study of a star's structure and energy. The vertical tower of the solar observatory supports a heliostat mirror which tracks the sun, gathers its rays, and reflects them down a light shaft that extends 300 feet below ground. At the end of the shaft, the rays are cast back to an observing room where minute by minute changes across the face of the sun are observed. Another mirror projects a light beam to a spectroscope, an instrument which splits the light into its component colors, a visible spectrum. The dark lines that cut across the spectrum band are produced by the radiation from the sun's interior shining through its atmosphere. Each line is the signature of a chemical element such as sodium, iron, calcium. It is this array of lines that forms the code which describes the properties and motion of a star. By narrowing the view of the sun to a single line of the spectrum, each level of the solar atmosphere can be photographed. And each reveals a remarkably different aspect. And with the addition of computer mapping and color processing that distinguishes levels of brightness, a detailed and multi-dimensional picture is obtained of a sun undergoing dramatic and turbulent change. The sun is a sphere of hot, seething gases and surges of radiation. Most of the light we get from the sun comes from the thin, bright layer which defines its visible edge, the photosphere. Above it, the chromosphere, a region of flaming outbursts of gas, extends through a transition zone to the thin outer atmosphere of the corona. Once thought to be a quiet layer of the solar atmosphere, the corona is now revealed to be a region of dramatic large-scale changes and unexpected turbulence, with temperatures reaching millions of degrees. Deep beneath the sun's atmospheric shell is the core, a violent nuclear furnace. Here, hydrogen is fused into helium, and in the process, some of the matter is converted into an enormous amount of energy. Radiating outward as a gas, it convects like a boiling liquid beneath the surface. The turbulent bubbling motion is visible in the granular cells of the photosphere. Sunspots, regions of intense magnetic fields, appear on the surface. Disappear in a few hours. Or grow and persist for months in a mysterious 11-year cycle. The sun rotates once in 27 days. Because its equatorial regions rotate faster than the polar caps, the shearing action in the gas contorts the magnetic field into tangled structures which give rise to the sun's eruptive action. Shaped by these magnetic fields, 
are the spectacular prominences, titanic streamers of gas reaching heights of more than a half a million miles above the surface. The greatest explosions in the solar system are flares, intense bursts of light erupting with the force of billions of hydrogen bombs. They move at hundreds of miles a second. Then, after minutes or hours, they fade away. The dark areas across the solar disk are coronal holes, which may provide new clues to the sun's interior, and may be a source of the solar wind that blows outward to the farthest planets. On Earth, effects of these solar events are visible when auroras light up the dark Arctic sky and radio communication is disrupted. The sun is an average, middle-aged star. Yet it will generate heat and light for billions of years to come, as it has for five billion years past. It dominates the motions of all bodies in the solar system. Nearest the sun and obscured by its intense glare is Mercury, a cratered planet much like our moon. Temperatures rise to 800 degrees, but no clouds or atmosphere protect its ancient surface from the searing heat. Moving outward from Mercury, we encounter Venus. Its perpetual cloud cover traps the radiant energy of the sun within an atmosphere of incredible pressures From the surface, only a reddish glow reveals the presence of the sun. Beyond Venus, 93 million miles from the sun, is Earth. Its great oceans forming the clouds and air currents which warm and irrigate the planet, shape its continents and nourish life. Its satellite, the moon, airless, waterless, and scarred by meteors that have bombarded it since the time of its formation, now bears the imprints of our astronauts. The probe of the planet Mars has discovered a dynamic and evolving planet with unexpected geological features. A volcanic mountain, many times larger than the largest volcano on Earth. A vast and deep canyon, extending for 2,500 miles. And dry, river-like channels that may have been carved by running water. Beyond the orbit of Mars is the belt of asteroids, craggy chunks of rock and metal, some as small as boulders, others hundreds of miles in diameter. About 500 million miles from the sun, we encounter the first of the giant gas planets, Jupiter, the colossus of the solar system more massive than all the other planets combined. Deep beneath the maelstrom of clouds that band its surface is a primordial atmosphere much like that in which life awakened on Earth millions of years ago. And drifting on its surface is the mysterious red spot an immense cyclonic storm that has raged for hundreds of years continues unabated. Radiating more energy than it receives from the sun and circled by 14 moons, 
Jupiter is like a miniature solar system. The next largest of the gas planets is Saturn girded by rings which, as we approach them, resolve into countless particles of frozen debris and ice, each a tiny moon orbiting the massive planet. And as we continue past the frozen worlds of Uranus and Neptune, we arrive at the outermost planet in the solar system, Pluto. It moves in a dim twilight of unimaginable cold. The sun, four billion miles away, is only a brilliant light in the night sky. To travel beyond the solar system to the nearest star would require a journey of more than five trillion miles. Yet our sun is only one of a hundred billion stars widely separated from one another in time and space, but all bound by gravity, and all revolving around the central core of our galaxy, the Milky Way. Drifting between the stars are vast clouds of gas and dust, the nebulae, made luminous by the radiation of stars within or near them. or darkly obscuring the light of whatever lies behind them. Here, new stars are being born. About a half century ago, our galaxy was thought to be alone in the universe. We now know it to be one of a local group of about 20 galaxies. And strewn through the vast reaches of space are more than 10 billion galaxies grouped in clusters as far as our most sensitive instruments can reach. Little is known about the evolution of galaxies and why some are formless or irregular, others elliptical, and still others spiral-shaped. And we know as little about the galactic core and its role in the galaxy's evolution and structure. The problem has become more perplexing by the discovery that some galaxies are in a state of extreme disarray, exploding, ejecting gaseous matter, or interacting with other galaxies. Even more puzzling are quasars, star-like objects, emitting as much energy every second as the sun radiates in some 10 million years. They appear to be among the most remote objects in space. Stars are born, live out their lifespans, and die. The life history of a star is marked by an opposition of two kinds of pressure. One is the pressure created by the energy in the core of the star, pushing the surface outward. The other is the crushing force of gravity pulling the star's surface inward. When these are balanced, a star becomes stable and shines steadily. As hydrogen fuel is depleted, the release of energy is insufficient to withstand the gravitational pressure and the core collapses. But compression by gravity raises the temperature in the core and helium ash rekindles the nuclear fires. Vast amounts of energy are released and lift the outer zones against the force of gravity. The star is now a red giant. In the final stage of its evolution, it is the mass of a star that determines its fate. The sun, a medium-sized star, remains stable for approximately 10 billion years. Then it will expand to 400 times its present diameter. As it expands, it will engulf the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and create a nebula extending past the outer planets. 
After millions of years, its reserves of nuclear fuel will be exhausted. Its outer layers will have dissipated. And only a white dwarf star remains, no larger than the Earth. Slowly cooling to zero temperature will end its life as a black stellar corpse. When a star more massive than the sun reaches the red giant stage, the collapse of its core raises its temperature billions of degrees and triggers a spectacular detonation. A supernova explosion. At the center of the explosion, a residue of the star is crushed by gravity to a neutron core, only a few miles across, but so dense that 10 billion tons of its matter would fill only a tablespoon. It spins rapidly, generating radio signals in its strong magnetic field. And a radiation beam sweeping past the Earth is observed as a pulse. The star is known as a pulsar. An even stranger end is predicted for very massive stars. According to the laws of gravity as presently understood, nothing can stop its collapse. The star disappears from our universe, leaving a black hole in space. Its presence can be deduced only by its influence on a visible companion star, distorted out of shape by the black hole's gravitational attraction. Gas, pulled off the visible star, circulates about the black hole. And in the dizzying plunge, it emits X-rays which can be detected in space. No light or matter can ever leave the intense gravitational field of this cosmic abyss. The physical laws that govern the conditions within this bizarre object are totally unknown to us. The evolving universe itself must come to an end. If it continues to expand indefinitely, the light of every star will in time be extinguished, and the galaxies will disappear into infinite darkness. But if gravity halts the expansion, the universe will fall back on itself. Galaxies will lose their separate identities. Stars will explode and the sky will again be ablaze with light. Finally, all matter engulfed in a fireball like that from which it emerged. All things on Earth, living and inert, are formed from the elements forged in some distant and unknown star. On Earth, atoms join together in definite numbers and patterns, compose the organic molecules which form living cells. Since the discovery of complex molecules in the chill vacuum of interstellar space, there is reason to believe that among the countless galaxies in the universe, there are stars orbited by planets favorable for the evolution of intelligent life. Is space travel to these planets possible? Time and distance may be insurmountable barriers. The spacecraft pioneer now speeding toward the outer planets and beyond, traveling at 35,000 miles an hour, would take almost 80,000 years to reach the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. A spacecraft traveling 2,500 times faster than Pioneer, at 10% the speed of light, would require so great an expenditure of energy that until new sources have been tapped, it must remain an invention of science fiction.
A more practical strategy in the search for extraterrestrial life is to tune in on radio signals traveling at the speed of light, beamed, perhaps, by creatures on the planet of some distant star. Someday, an array of telescopes, earthbound or lifted to the far side of the moon, may hear faint but unmistakably meaningful sounds amidst the din of cosmic radio chatter. That moment will signal a change in the human condition that we cannot foresee or imagine. For man, wrote H.G. Wells, there is no rest and no ending. He must go on, conquest beyond conquest. And when he has conquered all the deeps of space and all the mysteries of time, still he will be beginning. All right, so um, had to geek out a little bit with William Shatner and some um, NASA material, uh, you know, speaking about planets and about suns, life cycle and all that stuff. Pretty exciting. And yeah, William Shatner's got one of those voices that can just lull you into like, what is he talking about now? Um, so thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, we will be back tomorrow, or not tomorrow, uh, well, no. Let's erase all that. I'll be back at 3, um, at the same places, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, uh, with a, uh, expert about labor and unions, um, and we'll watch some films, excerpted films. Um, then at 6 o'clock, I put in the link, a, uh, we'll be showing a spider, Horror of Spider Island. And um, there's a link to get, it's going to be done via Zoom, so there's a link to kind of register and get the Zoom link when it's made available. So uh, thanks so much again for tuning in. I hope everybody has a good weekend. Um, I didn't get shut down by... The, the robot, so that's good, right? You know? Um, the car repair place is going to pay for our catalytic converter that was stolen uh, on their lot, uh, which is great. Um, and I have my health. I have my, my uh, wife's health. I have a house. And I have a job that doesn't really require me to have to drive far. So I feel pretty lucky. I know a lot of people are not in that situation, so my complaints are minor compared to some of the bigger complaints and bigger issues out in the world. So, um, it's AV Geek's problems, not even third uh, first world problems, it's, it's specific AV Geek's weird problems. Anyways, everybody have a great rest of your day, and maybe I'll see you again at uh, 3. Everybody take care.